Can you all hear me? Good. So I'll speak about scale-free percolation, and uh, there's a couple of words there that you might not recognize, so I'll have to explain those. Uh, that means uh, both scale-free and maybe percolation. Um, so first of all, this is joint work with two of, uh, two of my colleagues, Mia Deven, who's from Stockholm, and uh, Gerard Hoogiemstra, who is a long time collaborator, and he used to be in Delft, now he's retired, but he's still doing math. Um, and all of this came out of the desire to model complex networks. And here are just two pictures of complex networks. One is a yeast protein interaction network. So the, uh, the sites here are yeast proteins, and the edges are interactions between them. Can the lights be turned a bit lower? It may be difficult to see otherwise. <laughs> so as you can imagine, these are interactions between, uh, between proteins, and there's a lot of research going into a picture like this. You, you basically have to do biological experiments in order to see what the connections are between yeast proteins. Yeah, just continue? Okay. Um, another example is the internet topology. Uh, this may not be the most pretty pictures that you'll see on, uh, on real-world networks. Um, again, we see vertices and we see connections between them. In the internet, the vertices are routers and they're connected by physical cables. Um, of course, you can also think about the World Wide Web. That's much bigger, a few trillions of nodes, and uh, all the nodes are web pages, and the edges are directed links between those, corresponding to hyperlinks. And these networks, they come from all sorts of different disciplines, yet they share some features. And one of them is their, their scale-free behavior. So what happens is that if you draw a log-log plot of degree versus density, or the number of occurrences, then what you see is pictures that often have some sort of a straight line in them. And if it were to be a perfect straight line, then it would be a perfect power law. Um, here you see that there is some deviation from a power law here, but in general, scale-free can be interpreted to denote the fact that there is no typical scale. And I often draw the analogy with the heights of people. And in the Netherlands, if you look at the heights of, uh, of Dutch males, it's 183 on average. If you add 20% and subtract 20 centimeters and subtract 20 centimeters, so in between 163 and 203, you have the large majority of Dutch males. Some are, of course, a bit shorter. Some are a bit taller as well. Uh, above two meters is not uncommon in the Netherlands. But you have a vast majority of Dutch, uh, uh, of Dutch males in that category. So you could say that 183 is the typical height of a Dutch male. Now, if instead you look at something else, for example, incomes, it's much harder. So the average income in the Netherlands, I think, per year is something like 25,000 euros. But adding 10,000, subtracting 10,000, will definitely not get you the majority of people. You really have to multiply by 10, maybe even 100, to get the majority of people. Yeah? So you cannot really talk about what is the typical scale or the typical size of incomes in the Netherlands. So these are two features, sort of empirically, that are quite different. Um, one, um, the heights are very well approximated by uh, a normal distribution, so a nice bell shape, and the other, incomes, are not at all. And in incomes, what you often see is power loss. Pareto distributions. In fact, this is where the Pareto distribution came from. And you see something similar occurring in uh, degree sequences of these networks. And as you draw log-log plots, 
Straight lines correspond to power laws corresponding to uh, scale-free behavior. So that's one of the features that many of these models share, and there's a lot of empirical work going into this. Another property is the small world behavior. So many of these networks are extremely large. I already mentioned that the World Wide Web has uh, probably about a trillion uh, uh, web pages. Internet, we're talking about 300,000 routers. Uh, if you're thinking about social networks, they're gigantic as well. 700 million people are currently on Facebook, and I don't know how many people are on Yandex, uh, uh, the social uh, uh, website of that. So these are really very big networks. Yet, if you look at the graph distances within those, so for example, if you pick two pairs uniformly at random and look at the number of hops you need to go from one to the other, you typically find numbers that are relatively small. So here we see two examples. Here, for example, LiveJournal. This is a very big uh, uh, data set of about uh, a million or so, yet the maximal distance you see within this network between pairs of vertices is of the order 12 or 13. And if you take the average, it's probably somewhere around 7, maybe 8. So this is closely related to what is called six degrees of separation in social networks, but also this is a feature that is occurring in many of these networks. So we have networks. On the one hand, they're scale-free, meaning that you have power law degrees. On the other hand, you have very sh short distances in those. And the question is how to model that in an appropriate way. Now, the classical way to do this is by building a random graph. And here are three examples, and these are definitely not the only ones, but these are three examples of models that have been used in order to model real-life networks. And the first is what is sometimes called the inhomogeneous random graph. And an example of this is a homogeneous version of it, that is the Erdős-Wenyi random graph. Every vertex plays the same role. But you can also have settings, and I'll explain a little bit more about that on the next transparency. You can also have settings where the vertices play different roles. So it's not completely egalitarian. You have people who uh, have many more friends than others, and these somehow have uh, a bigger weight, a bigger probability of, of attaching to other vertices. That's what an inhomogeneous random graph is. A second model that has been investigated a lot is the configuration model. And the simplest way of thinking about the configuration model is that if you were to have a real-world network, an undirected graph, what you could do is cut open all of the edges and rewire everything completely uniformly at random. If you do that, then what you will get is this configuration model, but of course you're going to keep the degrees of vertices the same. So this is a model in which uh, the vertex degrees are all fixed, they're given to you beforehand, and then you create a model that is uh, a uniform random graph having those degree sequences. That's what the configuration model was invented for. So both of these are static. You decide how many vertices ha you have before you start constructing the random graph. Of course, another model that has been investigated a lot is the preferential attachment model. That's a dynamical model in which the graph grows as time proceeds, and you add vertices one by one, and you connect them to old vertices in the graph by some local rules. And the, nice, the very nice feature of a preferential attachment model is that it can explain where power laws come from. And these models cannot do that. They are static, and you somehow put the power laws in before you start. And in preferential attachment models, this is not the case. Um, due to the preferentiality in the connections that are taking place, you actually create graphs that have power laws. So the features are, are somewhat different. These models are all non-spatial. And of course, in real life, space, geometry, the planet on which we live, does play a role. We are much more likely to know people who live close by than we are uh, to know people who, are, who live very far away. Yet we do know people who live very far away. So how do you take that local geometric structure of your graph into account? So that's one feature that I would like to talk about today. Another problem with these models is they that they typically have very small clustering. Um, these preferential attachment models, but also these models, can be adapted in such a way that they have larger clustering. Um, 
But somehow, at least within the social context, I often think about clustering as arising from geometry. Because we tend to know people close by ourselves, these people are also more likely to know one another. And that actually gives rise to clustering. So the aim is to construct a relatively simple uh, random graph model in which you both have space as well as clustering. And uh, we'll do that by adapting this inhomogeneous random graph model. So let me explain in a little bit more detail what these inhomogeneous random graphs are and what they do. And I'll do that on the basis of one particular version of it, which is sometimes called the uh, noros raitu model. These are two mathematicians from, uh, from Finland. And the simplest version is, is formulated as follows. So you have vertices, and you equip every vertex in your vertex set, which is 1 up to n, and you know what n is beforehand, with an IID weight. That's what this WI is. So these are all IID random variables, and they have the interpretation of describing how many connections people will have. So a vertex with an extremely high weight is much more likely to be a friend of another vertex than a vertex that has a very low weight. So you somehow model in the inhomogeneity that is present in many of these networks. So by varying these weights, you will also vary the degrees. So how can one do that? Well, you can attach an edge with probability pij between vertices i and j, where this pij is 1 minus e to the power minus lambda times the weight of i times the weight of j divided by n. So these edges will be there conditionally on the weights with edge probabilities that are functions of the weights. And all of the edge variables conditionally on the weights are independent of one another. So it's a relatively simple model. Of course, the edges by themselves will not be independent because the dependency comes from the fact that the weights are all the same. But conditionally on the weights, they're independent. No? All right. So there are many more related models in which you change this law a little bit. So for example, you could take the product of the weights divided by n min 1. Or you could take the product of the weights divided by n plus the product of the weights. And these are all models that are uh, uh, quite similar. And in fact, uh, Svante Jansson has a paper in 2010 in which he provides conditions for asymptotic equivalence of these models. And asymptotic equivalence means that if, a, if an event occurs with a certain asymptotic probability as n tends to infinity for one model, it will actually occur with the same asymptotic probability for another model. That is what is asymptotic equivalence. Now this is a particular setup. It's sometimes called the rank 1 setup. And the rank 1 comes from the fact that you actually multiply these weights. Of course, you could do this much more generally and have a weight for every edge rather than weights for every vertex. And this general setup has been studied in a very famous paper by Bolobas, Janssen and Reardon from 2007. It's almost a book. It's a 120 pages in which they formulate these models in a very general setting and also investigate many of their properties. All right. So this model is a source of inspiration for our scale-free uh, a uh, percolation model. Now, what are some of the properties of this, uh, of this model? Well, as I mentioned, two of the important properties in, uh, in real-world networks is their scale-free behavior and the graph distances in them. So let's first look at the scale-free behavior by investigating the degrees in such random graphs. And one way you can do that is by looking at the empirical distribution of the degrees. So this is just pk of n is the proportion of vertices that has degree equal to k. So di here denotes the degree of vertex i. So you just count how many vertices are there with degree k, you divide that by the total number of vertices, and that will give you a random probability distribution. Now the question is, will this probability distribution somehow converge? And as it turns out, this is the case if you assume that the, the weights have a finite expectation, then this model is sparse and uh, the number of vertices with degree k converges to some limiting value, which is completely deterministic. And this deterministic value 
is um, a distribution which is closely related to a Poisson random variable. If these Ws would all be constant, this would be a Poisson random variable. But because these Ws are actually random variables themselves, this is sometimes called a mixed Poisson distribution. So conditionally on the weight, it's a Poisson distribution with that weight, but then you average out over all possible weights. And that is necessary because if this weight would be a constant value, then you would get a nice Poisson distribution, but we all know that a Poisson distribution has extremely thin tails. So it has faster than exponential decay at infinity. So it will never be scale-free. So if you want to have a scale-free setting in these inhomogeneous random graphs, you need to put in a lot of inhomogeneity, and putting in a lot of inhomogeneity means that you, these weights need to vary a lot. In particular, you will only have scale-free behavior, which means that the tails of this distribution decay like an inverse power law, when the weights satisfy the same thing. And in fact, the two, uh, the two exponents will actually be the same. Probably the constant will not, but the two exponents will. So you get a scale-free random graph if you start with scale-free weights. All right. Now there's many more properties that are actually quite interesting in, in homogeneous random graphs. So a property that has been investigated a lot in erdos winyi random graphs, but also in more general random graphs, is the occurrence of a giant component, as it is called. So in order to set up the notation, let's define Cmax to be the largest connected component in the graph. And let's just assume that this Cmax is unique. That simplifies life. So this is a collection of vertices. If I look at the size of that, which is what these uh, absolute value signs indicate, so that's the number of vertices in the largest connected component, and you divide through by n, so you get the proportion of vertices that is in the largest connected component, that proportion will converge in probability to some limiting value. Now, of course, when that limiting value would be equal to zero, this would not be such an interesting statement. But in fact, there is also a precise criterion as to when this limiting value is strictly positive. And in the setting of the inhomogeneous random graph, this is true when lambda is sufficiently large. And sufficiently large means that it has to be larger than 1 over the second moment of the weights. Recall I was assuming that the first moment of the weights is finite, but I haven't said anything about the second moment of the weights. So in fact, that could be equal to infinity. In many of the real uh, live networks, we are in a situation where the variance of the degrees is infinite, so it grows as the network grows, but the network is sparse, so the expected degree, or the average degree, remains constant as the, uh, the network uh, increases in size, but the second moment increases with n. So mm -hmm. if you want to have that, you need to <coughs> look for a situation where this second moment of the weights is infinity. And if that is infinity, then actually the critical value of my percolation model is zero. So that means that I have instantaneous percolation. No matter how small I choose my parameter, I will always have a giant component that contains a positive proportion of the vertices. And that's funny, because that doesn't occur in percolation models. Yes? Uh, in the fixed degree distribution graph, uh, the condition for percolation is the biased expected bias, the uh, distribution has to be bigger than one. Is that the re also the reason why the second moment here appears? Yes. Yeah. That's precisely the reason. So there is size biasing in this model as well. Yeah. So as I was saying, this proportion of vertices in the largest connected component is strictly positive. No matter how small lambda is, when the second moment is infinite. And that's precisely the case when my degree exponent is in between 2 and 3. So you have instantaneous percolation when you have finite mean but infinite variance degrees. And this is sometimes related to the vulnerability of the, uh, of the network. So this means that if I were to remove in such a network the edges all independently of one another, no matter how large of a proportion of edges you remove, 
you will always remain on having a, a giant component. This giant component will become thinner and thinner, but it will always contain a positive proportion of the vertices. So this somehow means that the random graph is robust under random attacks. It's not robust when you start removing vertices with very high weights. That's a different story. So that's sometimes called a targeted attack. But it's robust under uh, a random attack. And there are many more properties that this graph has. For example, um, related to the uh, small world properties, the graph distances have received a lot of attention and it turns out that there is rather different behavior for the graph distances depending on the precise value of the power law exponent. So if this power law is in between 2 and 3, distances grow doubly logarithmically. So that means that if I pick two vertices uniformly at random, I condition on them being connected, so that basically means that they're both in the giant component, then the length of the path linking them contains of the order log log n edges. That's very small. So if my graph becomes bigger and bigger, well, log log n tends to infinity, we can mathematically prove that, but you'll be hard pressed to see this in simulations. So this could possibly be an explanation for the six degrees of uh, separation uh, paradigm, because from the time that we started investigating sort of these distances, of course it's hard to do this uh, empirically, until now the population has grown, but it has not grown a lot. I mean, maybe it has grown from 1 billion to 10 billion. But if you take the log log of 10 billion and compare that to the log log of 1 billion, you don't see any difference. Yeah? So this is a quantification of this small world paradigm. It's a little different when tau is larger than 3 because then distances grow logarithmically. So you really see two different phases of our random graph model. One where you have finite second moment of the degrees, and one where you have infinite second moment of the degrees, and the behavior, the topology of the graph is rather different. So here we see that if the second moment of the degree, oh, sorry. Here we see that if the second moment of the degree is infinite, you will have instantaneous percolation. But if the second moment of the degree is finite, you will not have instantaneous percolation. So that's already a very distinctive qualitative separation between the two phases. And what you see here is that the distances are logarithmic when the degrees have a second moment, but they're doubly logarithmic when um, the degree sequences do not have a, sec a finite second moment. So you see two different phases of these random graphs that are quite differently behaved. Now here in red are some properties that we don't like so much about this model. And the first property is that the model has asymptotically zero clustering. Now clustering is a feature that is very important in real world networks and it describes uh, what the chance is that two of your friends actually are also friends of one another. So it's a measure of the number of triangles in the network. And if you have zero clustering, it basically means that the graph locally looks like a tree. And we all know that many real-life networks do not locally look like a tree. So this is a feature that is not very good in terms of real-world applications. Now, also if you think about statistical physics in general, then we always like to have models on an infinite graph, because on an infinite graph you can characterize the phase transitions precisely. Whereas always when you're on a finite graph, it's much more difficult to characterize what the phase transition is because a finite object cannot have a phase transition. You can only have a phase transition as the size tends to infinity. Now if we're thinking about phase transitions, one of the nicest models to, to find phase transitions is in percolation models. And one of the one of the versions of percolation models that I'll be interested in is what is called long-range percolation. And that is this model. So we work on ZD, on the full lattice, so infinite space. And we have an edge between two vertices X and Y in ZD with probability that depends on X and Y. But in fact, it only depends on the difference, the spatial difference, or the 
the, the norm of the difference of the two. So the probability of seeing an edge between x and y is 1 minus e to the power minus mm -hmm. lambda over x minus y to the power alpha for x and y different. Yes, yes. There's a lot of work on this. I'm just highlighting a few of the results. For example, there's a lot of work on this model in high dimensions as well that I'm also not referring to. Um, so what is the case here is that this, all of these edges are now independent. So that means that if you look at the degree of a vertex, what you get is that this degree is a sum of indicator variables. And all these indicator variables are independent, but they don't have the same success probability. No? Now, of course, we know such variables very well. And one of the things that we can compute about it is the mean and also the variance. So let me do that. Let's look at the expected degree. In fact, my model is translation invariant, so the expected degree is not going to depend on the vertex that you're looking at. It's the same for every vertex. So what is this? Well, this is the expectation, according to that formula, formula of the sum over y of these indicators. Of course, the expectation is linear, so I can pull the sum over y through, and I will get the expectation of ixy, but ixy is just an indicator variable, and therefore this expectation will actually be its success probability, which is pxy. <coughs> so that's what you get. And it's not very difficult to see that this is finite, when alpha is sufficiently large, and that means alpha is larger than d, and it's actually infinite when alpha is smaller. Now, when the mean is infinite, we're dealing with a random variable that is a sum of independent indicators with infinite mean, and such a random variable is actually infinite almost surely. That's much stronger. Normally, it's not necessarily the case that if a random variable has infinite mean, that, that, in, that then it will also be infinite almost surely. But here it is. So that means that in this setting, in fact, d of x is infinity almost surely. Now, that's not a very interesting setting in real-life uh, applications, because our average degree in many real-life networks is finite. So, this is something we will not be able to see. So, we'll not look at this, at this case. Okay? So, this is the expectation. Now, let's look at the variance. Because we've already seen that in many of these random graph models, the variance is a very important thing. And you see different behavior when the variance is finite versus the variance being infinite. All right, so let's compute the variance. But this is the variance of a sum of independent random variables. All my i's variables are independent. And the variance of a sum of independent random variables is the sum of the variances. So we get the sum over y of the variance of i x y. Turn this a little bit. I'm not sure whether everybody can see it. Okay. So what do we get out of that? Well, oh, the sum over y. It's the variance of a Bernoulli variable. The variance of a Bernoulli variable is the success probability times 1 minus the success probability. So that's pxy times 1 minus pxy. Right? And pxy is this variable. Now notice in particular that this is smaller than if we were to remove this. But if we remove that, we get the expectation. 
So that means that for all of these long-range percolation models, the variance is smaller than the expectation. So in particular, it is impossible to have a scale-free setting where you have finite mean but infinite variance, because the variance is always smaller than the mean. In fact, it is impossible to have a scale-free model at all, because if the mean is finite, this is a sum of independent indicators, and it's a sum of independent indicators with a finite mean that has extremely thin tails, thinner than exponential. So a long-range percolation model is a very nice model, but it can never have scale-free behavior. And that's somehow due to the fact that every point plays the same role. There's no inhomogeneity. There's not enough fluctuations that are possible uh, if you vary the different vertices. But still, it's a very beautiful model. So what are some of its properties? Well, one of the main properties is that we actually know that the percolation function, which is the probability that a vertex is in the, the infinite component, there can be an infinite component, that that function is continuous when alpha is in between d and 2d. So that's a result by uh, uh, Noam Berger in 2002. That's a very deep result. This is something that we do not know for percolation, nearest neighbor percolation, on zd in dimension 3. And in fact, if you were able to prove that, you would probably get a Fields Medal or a Nobel Prize or something like that. We really do not know how to do this. And there's a lot of uh, prizes that have recently gone to establishing the scaling limit for per nearest neighbor percolation in two dimensions. So percolation theory is a very important branch of mathematics, probability theory, statistical physics, uh, that has attracted a lot of attention. So one of the things that we do not know for the simple percolation model nearest neighbor percolation in three dimensions, a very relevant model, we actually do know here when this alpha is in between d and 2d. Also, you can look at the graph distances, and they grow like a power of the logarithm. The power is not one, it's some other peculiar uh, exponent, but we do know how fast they grow. Graph distances are polylogarithmic when alpha is in between d and 2d. The model clearly has high clustering. Why? Well, Ooh. Okay. did I take the wrong pen here? Oh, it's a flip chart marker. Ah. This is also a board marker. I'm sorry. So, if you look at a triangle in one of these uh, models, it could look like this. So you're on ZD, you take three points, and this will have a strictly positive probability. Because any edge will have a strictly positive probability. So that means that you're going to see many triangles in this model. And of course, it could be a triangle like this, but it could also be a triangle that is much longer. Right? If this is the lattice. All of these have strictly positive probability. So it has high clustering, and we like high clustering. But, as I explained, the model is never scale-free. That's the part that we do not like. And it's impossible to have instantaneous percolation. You can only have instantaneous percolation when the degrees are almost surely infinite. And that's a setting that is not very interesting. So the idea is to merge these two models, have a spatial model that on the one hand has high clustering, on the other hand um, also has scale-free behavior. So how can we do that? Um, I want to have scale-free behavior. 
Instantaneous percolation, that is a pro property that is interesting in its own right, I would say. Um, but it's not necessarily a feature that we know to be true on real-world networks. Okay, so what do we do? Well, we just merge the two models, and what we do is we have a model on ZD, where um, the vertices have an associated random weight, where these weights are IID random variables. That's like in the inhomogeneous random graph. And then conditionally on the weight, the edges are independent, and the probability that you have an edge between X and Y is equal to PXY, which is 1 minus e to the power minus lambda, WX, WY, divided by the spatial norm of X minus Y. So this edge probability looks a lot like long-range percolation. In fact, you do get long-range percolation when all of these weights are equal to 1, and the models are the same. So it really is a merger between the two. So let me write that down because that formula will be instrumental in the remainder of the talk. All right, so there's a couple of parameters that we see here. Namely, there are three. There's the lambda parameter, there's the alpha parameter, and there's the dimension. The long-range nature is determined by this alpha parameter. Mm -hmm. If alpha becomes much bigger, long-range edges, faraway edges, become less likely. The percolative properties, so the connectivity within the network, is governed by this lambda parameter. If lambda is zero, then these p's are all zero, so you're not going to have any connections, there's not going to be any percolation. When you make lambda bigger, you see more and more edges appearing. So lambda governs the percolative properties or the connectivity properties. And then there's inhomogeneity in the model, and that's determined by the distribution of these wx's. If these wx's vary a lot, over different vertices, then the model is going to be very inhomogeneous. If these WX's do not vary a lot, then the model is not going to be very inhomogeneous. In particular, when all the weights are the same, the model is translation invariant, and therefore not, uh, not uh, inhomogeneous at all. <laughs> so, as I mentioned, the model interpolates between long-range percolation, which you get when you take all the weights to be equal to 1, in homogeneous random graphs, which is the model that I've uh, described before, and also in a certain sense, it looks a bit like the small world model of uh, uh, Strogatz and Watts, which lives on a torus, that's not quite ZD, but it's a torus in ZD, um, that's the vertex set, and you only have nearest neighbor connections, as well as very long, Macroscopic connections. This is some, sometimes obtained uh, by rewiring uh, the edges. <laughs> so these are macroscopic connections basically between uniform vertices. So my model doesn't really have that, but what it instead has is connections on all length scales. So you have, I mean, the majority of the, of the links will be close by, but there will be larger links basically on every length scale, because these probabilities are positive for every x and y, no matter how far apart they are. So what will we be interested in? Well, the first thing is the scale-free property. So what is the degree structure? How many neighbors do vertices have? And how likely is it that they have very many neighbors? Does that drop off like an inverse power? What about the percolative properties? So is there a giant component? Is there an infinite component? We're living on ZD now. Does that instantaneously occur or not? 
And what is the behavior of the distances? If I take two vertices which are extremely far apart in ZD, how long is the path along the edges that are present in my model to go from one to the other? That is what the, uh, the graph distances describe. So how does the graph distance between x and y grow if x and y become further and further apart? Does that grow very quickly or does that grow very slowly? If that grows very slowly, then we could think of this as being a small world. <coughs> Any questions about the model? I haven't stated any results yet, but that will come. When you oh. left suspiciously asked by Steve. Oh, it, it, it has clustering, right? By the same reason that long range percolation has clustering. So the question is I've left out the clustering in the graph, and my remark is that this graph is going to have lots of triangles because the probabilities are going to be sizable when vertices are close by. So again, you're, it's going to be quite likely for a vertex to be connected to two neighbors and then these two neighbors to also be connected to one another. Graph. Uh, you start with a weighted graph in which yes. weights of the uh, edges a sort of gravity model, uh, gravity okay. model, um, wx, wy uh, divided by the. That's distance. called a gravity model. That's, that's Gravitation. Model that's no, okay. and in physics, and in physics, of course, no, also. No, in <laughs> physics, <laughs> alpha equals two. Very much. The spirit of this is very much like the gravity model, describing international trade. Ah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. There, there, alpha is taken to be two, to be to be specific. Okay. And D? But, but D is two as well. Uh, pardon? Alpha is two and D is two. No, D, D is two. Yeah. The yeah. dimension of the space. Yeah, it's flat. And then also alpha is two. Alpha, no. Alpha, alpha is two in the physics, uh, but not in gravity models. In economic theories, alpha is about one, like all. Okay. Time. I would love to see some references for that. Yes. Yes. That's precisely I see, what I do. Maybe yeah. in what is interesting is the previous stage, the weight, the whole weight graph with these weights on the edges. But then the question, of course, is what do you want to study about yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So let's get to some theorems. I have eight of them, and they investigate precisely the properties that I, that I uh, uh, refer to. Namely, the degree properties, the percolative properties, and the distances. And let's start with the degrees. The first theorem characterizes when the degrees are infinite almost surely. Remember that we had this, uh, uh, this situation occurred in long-range percolation. And here it's true that if we condition the weight of vertex zero to be strictly positive. Well, if it's zero, then the degrees are zero because all of the p's are equal to zero. So that's not very interesting. So if I condition the weight to be strictly positive, then, I, then the, the, the p's are, uh, are positive as well. And then the probability of the degree of any point, in particular the origin, is equal to infinity is one. So it's almost surely equal to infinity. Under two conditions. Either alpha is less than or equal to d. We already saw that that was relevant um, for long-range percolation. But there is another setting, and that is when a certain parameter gamma is equal or is, is strictly smaller than one. So I need to explain what that gamma is. So here I haven't said very much about the structure of the weights. In inhomogeneous random graphs, you only get scale-free behavior when the weights are scale-free themselves as well. And that turns out to be true here as well. So I will be assuming that these weights are scale-free, meaning that they have a parallel distribution. And a parallel distribution is characterized 
by this being equal to an inverse power of the variable. And then we can allow for some fudge factors, less important uh, asymptotic factors, which are uh, slowly varying functions. Oh, and x is equal to w. That's very important. So this L is slowly varying. If you don't know what that is, it doesn't matter. Just think of it as being constant. Okay? So now we've introduced a final parameter in our model, and that is this tau, which describes the tail behavior of our weights. So now we have three important uh, parameters. A lambda is a parameter that we will vary. Okay? So that I, I don't mean that one. But we have alpha, which describes the, uh, the geometric behavior. We have tau, and then we have the dimension. And this gamma variable actually depends on all of them. So it's alpha times tau minus 1 divided by d. If that parameter is smaller than 1, then the degrees are all infinite with probability 1. All right. Now, if that is not the case, so let's assume that this uh, value is actually strictly larger than 1, and let's not worry at what uh, happens when uh, the parameter is precisely equal to 1. When this is strictly larger than 1, then it turns out that the degrees are scale-free themselves. So the probability that the degree of a vertex is larger than s drops off like an inverse power of s times a slowly varying function as well. And the exponent that appears in this scale-free behavior is precisely this parameter. So this says that the tail exponent, when it's larger than 1, which means that the, uh, the average degree, the mean degree, is finite, then the tail behavior of the degrees, the probability that the degree is very large, drops off like an inverse power of uh, the value. So, power law degrees in a percolation model, that's why we call this a scale-free percolation model. So I want to present some of the proofs of these results. Some of these proofs are actually very simple. And I always like simple proofs. Okay, so let's look at the first theorem. The first theorem looks at when the degrees are infinite almost surely. I'll just assume that lambda is equal to 1. That makes it a little bit easier. And I'll take alpha, which is strictly positive, but also alpha, uh, uh, gamma is actually smaller than 1. And I'll assume that alpha is at least d. When alpha is less than or equal to d, you can repeat the old argument for long-range percolation. So I'll not assume that. So alpha is larger than d, and gamma is smaller than 1. In this case, you can compute that then also tau has to be in between 1 and 2. And if you do that, that means that the expectation of the weight is actually infinite. And then you can compute how the expectation of the weight with an extra indicator that the weight is less than or equal to s, how that blows up as s becomes larger. And it turns out that this blows up like a positive power of s. And that power is 2 minus tau. So tau is in between 1 and 2. What you see is that this power is strictly positive, and this indeed implies that the, the weights have infinite mean. All right. Now let's look at the expectation of the degree then. That's the same as this. I condition the weight to be equal to w, and that's a value that is strictly positive. I look at the probability that the edge between 0 and y is occupied, and I sum that out over all possible y. And when I do that, that's the same thing as this sum, because this is what the edge probability is. And there's a trivial inequality on y minus the exponential that allows you to write it like that. And then using this behavior, what you get is a certain inverse power of w times a sum over all y of 1 over the norm of y to the power alpha times tau minus 1. But when this is smaller than 1, this exponent is smaller than d, 
and therefore this sum is actually infinity. So what you get is that the expectation of the degree conditionally on the weight of the vertex to be equal to W, that expectation is equal to infinity. But if I condition the weight of the origin to be equal to little w, actually the degree is a sum of independent indicators. So it's a sum of independent indicators, its mean is infinity, therefore it's going to be infinity almost surely. And we're done. A relatively simple proof. It makes use of the independence, or at least the conditional independence, if I fix uh, the weight of the vertex that I'm interested in. No? All right. So that was the easy case. Now what happens when alpha is larger than d, and this degree uh, exponent, gamma, is larger than 1? Then we'll make use of a, a different asymptotics, and it's the following asymptotics. If I take 1 minus e to the power a constant divided by the norm of y to the power alpha, and I sum that over all possible y, and now I assume that a is extremely large. If a is extremely large, then for all small values of y, this is actually going to be 1. But of course, when y is extremely large, this is going to be very small. Yeah? So that means that if a is becoming very big, this actually starts blowing up. And the question is, how does it blow up? Well, it turns out to blow up like a positive power of a. You can compute what this power is, and that's d over alpha. Okay? All right. Now let's fix again the weight of the origin to be equal to little w. And let's suppose that this w is quite large. And what do we get? Well, then the expectation of the degree, that's just equal to this. I've substituted in that one of the w's for x is equal to zero is little w. And I can compute what this asymptotics is. And that turns out to be a power of little w. And the power is d over alpha. Now again, when I condition on the weight of a single vertex to be equal to little w, the degree of the origin is a sum of independent indicators. Therefore, it will be very closely concentrated around its mean, if the mean is very large. So that means that if I want the degree to be large, that's roughly the same thing as saying that the conditional mean is actually very large. And that's the same thing as this object being quite large, meaning larger than s. And that's the same thing as the weight being larger than this. So now I've transferred between the degree which I actually do not know, and the weight distribution, which I do know, because I know what the asymptotics of that is. And if you do that, you get that the probability that the degree is quite large is the same thing as an inverse power of s. And that power of s that appears turns out to be precisely minus gamma. So apparently this gamma really describes the geometry of our model, or at least the geometry of the degrees. And it's this peculiar combination alpha times tau minus 1 over d, that plays a very crucial role. So what we see is that we have a model that is scale-free, because the degrees, the, the, the probability of the degree is larger than s, drops off like an inverse power of s, <coughs> and the power that appears there is this alpha times tau minus 1 over d, and if gamma is larger than 1, then you have finite mean degrees, if gamma is larger than 2, we have finite variance degrees. And if gamma is in between 1 and 2, you have finite mean but infinite variance degrees. So what we see is that we've constructed a geometric model that is scale-free on the one hand, unlike long-range percolation, and in which there are settings where the mean degree is finite, yet the variance of the degrees is infinite. That's where we stand now. Now if we look back at these inhomogeneous random graphs, we see that this uh, setting where the, the mean of the degrees is finite but the variance is infinite is very interesting and it has peculiar properties. You have instantaneous percolation, you have very, sh very small distances, log-log, ultra-small world, it's sometimes called. So the question is, is this true in this model as well? Yes. Uh, doesn't it uh, then make sense to fix, for instance, alpha equal to d, uh, 
um, and then um, have complete control over this part because now you, your your scale free parameter is defined by three different parameters. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Uh, no. Uh, no, that does not make sense because if you take alpha is equal to d, oh you're yeah. in this setting, so you oh have then infinite you get degrees. Infinite. Okay. So yeah, life I is not so co no, uh, not so simple. Okay, because I saw this that uh, something funny happens with the distances in this case when you have two dimensional model and you choose also alpha equal to two. That's why it's a question. Yes. Right, in the long range uh, setting. In the long range setting, yeah, right. yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, but here it doesn't make sense, okay. Uh, Another question. Could I re rephrase this question? Where do I see that it's not the ratio of alpha to d that is important, but alpha and d are important on their own? Well, you see, in many expressions you have alpha over d, right? Yep. So where, where do I see that? that the there. Oh, that's also a ratio. Yeah, yeah, so apparently alpha over d is the important uh, parameter if you think about the, uh, about the geometry. So, so then you have one parameter less. If you want to think of it that way, yes. yes. Um, but it's not entirely the case, because one dimension is special, always. Because it's a percolation model, and percolation models, one dimension is always special. Oh. Oh, yeah, but this is really the generative. Well, okay. Anyway, so except for except for one dimension, you would say that it's in fact in fact you have two independent parameters. For the degrees, yes. I believe that if you start looking at more fine properties of the model, for example, let's say the upper critical dimension, that's it. Maybe a different story. It's not clear that that is also a function of alpha over d. At least this this is an something to think about yeah. yes yeah we definitely do not know everything about this model okay so now we know when the model is scale free <coughs> we need to have weights that are scale free the scale free nature of the weights is de described by this uh, power law exponent and then the model will be scale free as well with this gamma being the uh, the exponent So the next question is, when do we have percolation? And is there a setting where we have instantaneous percolation? And in order to describe that, let's first describe in more detail what percolation is. So I will be assuming that this power law exponent is larger than 1 from now on. So we are always in a setting where the mean degree is finite. <coughs> then we can write that x is connected to y when there exists a path of occupied bonds connecting x and y in my random graph. That's the usual definition. And then for a given x, I can look at all of the vertices that are connected to x. That's the cluster of x. And percolation occurs when there exists at least one of these x's for which the component has an infinite size. And that's the same that's closely related to the percolation probability, which is just the probability that a given vertex has an infinite cluster. It's not very hard to see that for this particular model, if this percolation probability is strictly positive, then there will be an infinite component, and it will also be unique. So every vertex that is in, in an infinite component is actually in the same infinite component. That's not always true, but in this case it's true because we're living on ZD. Okay? So the percolation probability is a very important property of the model. And it just describes the probability under the model as a function of this parameter, lambda, to be in an infinite component. And then, of course, you can define the critical percolation value, which is denoted by lambda C, the critical value, and that's the smallest lambda for which theta of lambda, the percolation function at lambda, is strictly positive. So if I take a lambda that is larger than lambda c, there will be a unique infinite component. If I take a lambda that is strictly smaller than lambda c, I will not have an infinite component. That's the game. <coughs> 
What happens at lambda is equal to lambda c is unknown. That's how it often is in percolation models. So let's suppose that we're in dimension greater than or equal to 2. In that case, we can show that this lambda c, the critical value, is actually finite. So that means that there exists a finite value of lambda, and if I'm above that value, there will be a unique infinite cluster. Now, here you see that it's a little bit more tricky in dimension 1, and that's because dimension 1 in percolation models is often uh, pathological. And we do have some criteria uh, for lambda c to be finite or infinite. Both can occur, uh, but these are probably not sharp either. I'm always thinking about dimension greater than or equal to 2. It's much more interesting. Okay? So we know that for dimension greater than or equal to 2, when we're not in a trivial situation, when all the weights are, of course, equal to 0, then there's never going to be percolation because all of the p's are equal to 0. When that does not occur, then lambda c is actually finite. As it turns out, of course, it's also interesting to know when lambda c is equal to 0 or not. Do you have instantaneous percolation or not? Lambda c is strictly larger than 0 when this parameter gamma is strictly larger than 2. So that's finite variance degrees again. Whereas lambda c is equal to 0 and you have instantaneous percolation when this parameter is in between 2 and 3. Uh, sorry, 1 and 2. So that means that however small lambda is, the probability that a vertex is in a giant component, is in the infinite component, is strictly positive. Of course, this probability will become very small, but it's always positive, no matter how small lambda is. So this is a regime that cannot occur in long-range percolation. You really need the weights in order to establish this. Questions? No? Okay. So, this is identical to what happens in the noros reitu model, where also when you have infinite second moment for the degrees, you have instantaneous percolation, and when you have a finite second moment for the degrees, you do not have instantaneous percolation. So it's the same feature that we see here, but it's novel for percolation models. So let's look at the proof for this theorem, and that's first prove that the critical value is strictly positive. So that occurs um, when the second moment of the degrees is finite. I'll start by proving this in a slightly, uh, in, on a slightly uh, more stringent condition, and that is that the second moment of the weights is finite. That is stronger than the second moment of the degrees being finite. But it just makes the analysis a little easier. So what do we do then? Well, if the cluster of the origin has infinite size, then there exist paths starting from the origin, and because all the degrees are finite, there exists a path starting from the origin of an arbitrary length. So let's compute the expected number of paths of a given length. So what do we get? The probability that the cluster of the origin is infinite is bounded from above by the sum over all possible vertices, the probability that uh, all of these bonds, so xi minus 1, xi is occupied for every i between 1 and n. So that means that there exists a path of occupied bonds starting from the origin of length n. So what is this? Well, these edges are not independent, so I cannot write this as the product of the probabilities. And that's because they are dependent due to the weights that are present. So edges are conditionally independent, but because these weights actually depend on the... Sorry, the, the probabilities actually depend on the weights, the edges are actually dependent. So one has to be pretty careful here. So what do we do? We condition on the weights, and then the probability that all these edges are occupied is going to be the expected value with respect to the weights, 
of the product of the edge probabilities. And that's what this is. And recall, these edge probabilities, when we condition on the weights, are given by this function. Now it's 1 minus an exponential, and 1 minus e to the power minus x is bounded from above by x. That's a very crude inequality. It's quite good when x is small, but it's not very good when x is large. So let's just apply that inequality. And when we do so, we get that this pxy is bounded from above by lambda times wx wy times this inverse power of x minus y. That's what we get. So if I do this for every single one of them, what you see is that there is a wx and a wy for every edge x and y. So if I follow a path, I will see that the weight of every vertex will occur precisely twice, except for the starting and the end point, because there's two edges that go through any intermediary point. So I will get two factors of the weights there. So that means that I get second moments. That's precisely what I see here. So all of these are independent, so that means that the expectation of the product will just factor when I take into account that these wx's actually appear twice. So if I then uh, compute the expectation of the product of these weights, I will get an expectation of a single weight twice for the starting and the ending points, and an expectation of the square of the weights n minus one times. And here we see why it's important that we were assuming that the weight have a finite second moment. Then this will actually be a finite value. So I can bring these out, and what I will get here is lambda times this expectation of the second moment raised to the power n, apart from some uh, constants. And then I have these products which still need to be summed out over all of the x's. But that sum also factors, and it just turns into the sum over all x unequal to zero of one over x to the power minus alpha. And that raised to the power n. So if alpha is larger than d, which I was assuming, this sum is actually finite. So that means that this one is finite, this one is finite, and what I get is that theta of lambda is bounded from above by some constant raised to the power n. And I can make this constant arbitrarily small by choosing my lambda to be sufficiently small. So if I take lambda to be sufficiently small, theta of lambda will be smaller than a constant, smaller than one raised to the power n, that's true for every n, therefore theta of lambda has to be equal to zero. And when is this going to occur? When lambda is such that this number here, which is a very explicit thing, is strictly smaller than one. Now that's a finite value. I use Cauchy Schwartz on that. The expectation of W squared is bounded from above by the expectation of W squared. But I didn't want to go into that uh, particular trick. That's just a, I mean, otherwise you would get a constant here, which wouldn't make, make, uh, change the argument at all. So what you see is that if lambda is so small that it cancels this term here, so lambda smaller than this value, what you get is that theta of lambda is less than or equal to a smaller uh, a constant smaller than one raised to the power n for every n, therefore theta of lambda has to be equal to zero. So it proves that theta of lambda is equal to zero for any lambda less than or equal to one over this constant. And that's a strictly positive constant. Now, when we're not assuming that the second moment is finite, but the real condition, then the argument is a little bit more tricky. Because now the second moment is not infinite, uh, is infinite, so we have to be a little bit more careful. And this simple uh, bound will not suffice. So we have to do cauchy schwartz a little bit uh, more clever, and if we do that, then we see again that we get something which is finite, uh, a constant which is finite raised to the power n, and the constant we can make arbitrarily small by making lambda small. Uh, I have a question about yeah. the finite second moment case. Uh, that argument uh, fails badly when you s deal with the standard percolation model, right? It doesn't give you uh, this uh, argument of counting pass and counting of expected number of open pass doesn't give you the right condition for percolation in the standard percolation model, uh, grid percolation. But okay. your condition for percolations are tight, right? Yes. So, so does it? This is a simple argument. A simple argument, but it 
gives the right. Uh, you, you have a tight condition for percolation, right? Uh, yes, but then you have to do this argument. Understand. Yeah. Uh, does it mean that the percolation, when it happens, so when you actually do have an infinite component, it's driven by long, um, uh, long edges, by and large? So even if you kill all the short edges, you still have an infinite yes. component? Uh, yes, it's driven by long edges, and it's particularly driven by long edges between vertices that have extremely high weights. Okay. That's the whole point. Yeah. Okay, so these two arguments... Am I doing this time? These two arguments show that the critical value is strictly positive when um, this parameter gamma is larger than 2. So when you have finite variance degrees. What happens when the parameter gamma is in between 1 and 2? So what I want to show then is that you have instantaneous percolation. So irrespective of how small lambda is, you will always find a giant component. So I will need to find an argument that will tell you that any point is in an infinite component with strictly positive probability irrespective of how small lambda is. And that can be done using a renormalization argument. And this really makes it precise um, how the large weights influence uh, the connectivity properties. So what we do is instead of looking at Zd by itself, we cut up Zd into large blocks. And then we know that because these weights have a power law distribution, that if I take a very large block, the weight, the maximal weight, inside such a large block will actually be quite large. It will be some positive power of the size of the block. Now if I have vertices with extremely high weights inside blocks, they will have a substantial probability of being directly connected. So I'm sort of going towards regular percolation. I, I divide things up into blocks, and nearest neighbor blocks will be with very high probability connected directly. If I can tune it in such a way that the probability that the nearest neighbors will be connected will be arbitrarily close to one, then I will be in a nearest neighbor percolation setting where the percolation probability is very close to one. That will percolate. That's the whole trick. So that's a renormalization argument. So how do we do this? So I, I take some radius which is extremely large. Yes. Oh. Theorem 5 was saying that the critical value is equal to zero when um, the power law exponent is in between 1 and 2, so in the infinite variance degree case. All right, so I'm trying to do a renormalization argument. I fix a value of my blocks which is extremely large and which is going to depend on lambda. And it will become larger and larger when lambda becomes smaller and smaller. Then I know because of these weights being independent and having a power law distribution, I know that if I take the maximal weight inside a large box of radius r to the power of lambda, it will grow like a positive power of r to the lambda. And what is the power? Well, it's the number of points, which is r, to the, uh, r lambda raised to the power d, divided by the tail exponent of my weights. So the largest value will be of the order, the radius to a power, which is d over tau minus 1. So these become extremely big. Okay? So suppose I, I cut up my zd into these large blocks, and I look at just the vertices, that has the largest weight in these blocks. What is the probability that two of these maximal weight vertices in uh, nearest neighbor blocks will be connected to one another? Okay. Well, so first, I take x of lambda, which is the maximal weight vertex in one of these blocks, around x, and I say that my renormalized model is such that x and y is occupied when the edge is between this maximal weight vertex around x and the maximal weight vertex around y are directly connected. That's it. So I've cut up my space into these extremely large blocks. I look at the vertex 
that has maximal weight inside these blocks, and I just verify whether these vertices of maximal weight between neighbor, nearest neighbor blocks have a direct edge or not. <laughs> now, if this occurs, then, uh, and you get an infinite component of such connections, then there definitely will also be an infinite component in my original model, because I'm actually only looking at a very small subpart of my, uh, my model. Okay? So, under the renormalization, what is the probability that in my renormalized setting, an edge between X and Y is actually occupied? Well, that's the same thing as saying that the, the edge in my unnormalized model between the maximal weight vertex around X and the maximal weight vertex around Y, that this edge is directly there. Okay? And X and Y are nearest neighbors. So what is this probability? Well, we just stick in what this is. So we have that this probability is 1 minus e to the power minus lambda, the weight of this x lambda, times the weight of y lambda, times the distance between x lambda and y lambda. But that's of the order r lambda, and then we take that to the power alpha. So that's a, an approximation. And we know how large these weights are. They are of the order r lambda raised to the power d over tau minus 1. So what we get in the end, if we stick that in, is we get some simple function of r lambda. And what you see is that this exponent of r lambda is strictly positive precisely when this gamma parameter is smaller than 2. And that was the setting that we were in. Infinite uh, variance in degrees. So that means that this exponent of r lambda is strictly positive. That means that we can make this probability in my renormalized uh, model, the probability that two nearest neighbor blocks are connected to one another, I can make that arbitrarily close to one. By choosing my r lambda extremely large. But this relation is not independent, right? Ah, but this almost makes it independent. Of course, you have to be careful. It's actually one dependent. And there is a very general result that says that if you can push in a one dependent process, if you can make all of the edge probabilities converge to one, then actually also the one dependent process will, will percolate. We're making use of that. So this means that we can take our lambda such that this parameter, which still contains the little lambda in it, and lambda is extremely small, we can choose r lambda such that lambda times this power of r of lambda is much larger than 1. Of course, that means that we have to take these r lambdas, these blocks, this renormalization, to be larger and larger, but we don't care about that. And if we do this, then my one-dependent percolation problem will be sup supercritical for small lambda, and therefore there will be an infinite component, and therefore also the original model will have an infinite component. So again, this argument is not very difficult. It's a relatively straightforward uh, renormalization argument. Of course, you have to be a little bit careful because I'm, I'm using a lot of, sort of wavy arguments here. And particularly this argument, making this precise and sticking that into this, these formulas is somewhat tricky. Okay. That requires a bit, bit more. But in the end, it gives that theta of lambda is strictly positive, however small lambda is. So we have instantaneous percolation. Okay, so I've investigated degrees, I've investigated the percolative properties, now let's look at distances. And recall that in inhomogeneous random graphs, if the degrees have infinite variance, distances grow like log log of the size of the network, if you have finite variance degrees, distances grow logarithmically with the network. That's true in inhomogeneous random graphs. Now here we have a spatial model, so that of, that of course changes life a little bit. Because in a classical random graph, what we typically do is, we take two vertices uniformly at random, we condition on them being connected, because otherwise the distance is infinity, that's not very interesting. We condition them to be connected, 
And then we look at the path between them. How many edges does it contain? Here we're on the whole of ZD, so picking two vertices uniformly at random is a little bit hard. So instead what we do is we just take two vertices that are very far apart. And then we look at the length of the path between them. How does that grow if the points move away further and further? Alternatively, what you could do is formulate the model on a torus. That's also possible. And then you can take two vertices uniformly at random, condition on them being connected. That will be a setting that is more closely related to uh, the random graph setting as we usually study it. So, here we're taking two vertices. Take them to be very far apart and look at the graph distance between them. And this is what the graph distance is denoted by. So, I, I start at the origin. I look at some point x, which is very far away. And I look at the number of edges that is needed in my infinite uh, cluster to go between 0 and x. And the result says that if I condition on 0 and x being connected to one another, that has a strictly positive probability, and here we have a gamma which is in between 1 and 2, so there we are in the instantaneous percolation setting, so the probability that 0 and x are connected to one another is strictly positive, and then the probability that the distance is at most some constant times the log log of the norm of x converges to 1. So again, we have ultra-small distances. And in this case, it turns out not to be very complicated to construct these short paths. So if you have 0 here and x there, what you could do is try to find in disjoint regions vertices of extremely high weight. We've already seen that these vertices of extremely high weight are very relevant. And you can just hop from one vertex of high weight to another vertex of even higher weight to create the connection between the two vertices. So not only do we know that this path is not very long, we can also explicitly construct one of these paths and look at the geometric properties of such a path. So this is precisely the same as what happens uh, in these inhomogeneous random graphs. Distances are of the order log log. Well, there it's n, here it's the norm of x. And we also have a matching lower bound that says that the probability that 0 and x are connected by a path that is too short tends to 0. So the distances are at least 2 log log x over the absolute value of log kappa. For some other kappa, that probability converges to 1. So distances really are of the order log log of x. We don't really know the precise constant that is involved there. Because here we get log kappa, there we get log gamma minus 1, and these are not necessarily the same. These are only the same when alpha is sufficiently large compared to gamma. Okay? So in the infinite variance regime, what we see is that distances grow log log with how far apart the vertices are. That's, of course, an extremely small world. If I take my vertices to be extremely far apart, let's say uh, between Russia and uh, Brazil, you'll be able to get there quite quickly. Yeah? So what happens when we have finite variance degrees? So remember that in the uh, inhomogeneous random graph model, we had logarithmic distances. So here we know that the distances are at least logarithmic. But they could actually be something else, and we don't know what it is. There are some other sharper criteria under which we know that the distances grow at least like a power of the norm of x. So much larger. So these paths really are much longer. But we don't really know how, they, how long they are. And that's a well-known problem also in long-range percolation, where in many cases we also don't really know what the length of these paths are. I'm close to the end. A few open problems. Um, the critical behavior. Is the percolation function continuous? This is a very important problem in percolation theory. I haven't said anything about that. And we really don't know. This is probably a very difficult problem. 
Um, for example, what is the upper critical dimension? What happens in two-dimensional settings? That's a good question. I don't know. Uh, it should probably be six when alpha is sufficiently large. Yes. Yeah. But it's probably not six when alpha and tau do something awkward. That would be my guess. And uh, this is in fact also known in the norris reiting model. There you, s you get the same scaling limit for the as for the erdos random graph when the gamma parameter is larger than three, so finite third moment of the degrees, but you get a different scaling limit when you have a finite second moment, but not a finite third moment. And the scaling limit really is different, and also the growth of the largest connected component at the critical point is different. It's no longer two-thirds. It's a smaller power that interpolates between one-half and, uh, and two-thirds. So distances, our results are very far from complete. Can we uh, uh, extend those? Um, there's a beautiful paper by Benjamin E. Kesten, Perez, and Schramm, in which, as a side result, they prove that if um, the degrees are infinite almost surely, the diameter of the infinite cluster is bounded, and they can compute it. A very cute argument. I would guess that also in our setting, when the degrees are infinite almost surely, the diameter will be bounded. But we have no proof. Um, it's interesting to study processes on such models, random walks or other processes. Mm, yes, that's a very good uh, question. Uh, the degrees are infinite almost surely. So that means that if there's two points that are very far apart, okay, I will actually start using very long edges to go rapidly between these two points. And apparently, irrespective of how far these points are apart, you can do this in a finite number of steps. But it's a very uh, counterintuitive statement. Uh, you're in a setting where everything is in the, in the infinite component. You're on ZD, so the infinite component is everything, yet you can hop between any two vertices in a finite number of steps. That's very weird. They want me to repeat the question for their recording. So the question was, how can the diameter of an infinite object be finite? Yes. I try to repeat that in my answer. Um, there, are many other, oh, there are many other spatial models, uh, uh, particularly uh, uh, preferential attachment spatial models. These are very interesting as well, but there's not a lot of work that has been done on those. And here's the literature. Thank you. <laughs>